Welcome, my everybody. First thing is going to be Does this work? Obligations Can anybody hear me? Business. Fantastic. <laughs> So come on in, scoot up to the front if you want. We're really hoping to encourage a, a nice conversation here about who pays for what. Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna make Douglas pay for everything. Uh. <laughs> Seriously, if you wanna scoot up, that's fine. Or you can just stay where you are. You need power, all right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Is that all right with everybody? Oh, it's already time. Yeah, I was going to say, it's 4 o'clock. You start on time. We're starting on time. All right, we're very, uh, we're very time sensitive. Thank you for coming to this professional forum. We really hope you're going to find it interesting. And, um, we've been talking about this for a while among the panelists, and, and there's a lot of interesting questions that we're hoping to bounce off of each other and bounce off of you. I'm trying to encourage a lot of audience participation on this session, so please oh, actually, feel free to jump in uh, on any <laughs> thoughts you might have on the overall topic, which we um, intentionally made a bit provocative on negotiating the obligations and expectations between large and small museums when it comes to supporting museum computing. So I am Paul Marty. I'm a professor in the School of Information at Florida State University. And I'm delighted to introduce our four panelists. We have from left to right, Carolyn Royston from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, Jane Alexander from the Cleveland Museum of Art, Rob Lansfield from Wesleyan University, and Loic Talon from the Met. Please give a round of applause to them for taking their time to answer these questions. Thank you all, and thank you all for coming. So, I wanted to start by taking a quick trip down memory lane. A, a long time ago that wasn't, I guess, all that many years ago, but long enough ago so that it feels like another lifetime. Some of us might have done a little bit of experimenting with a little program called Second Life. How many people played around with Second Life, right? I'm still baffled when people will talk to me about Second Life and I will say to them, well, is that still a thing? Right? Does that still exist? <laughs> Apparently it is, but uh, you know, surprising. So uh, back when Second Life was a thing, I did a little bit of research in Second Life, I played around a lot with Second Life, I wrote a couple of papers, and as a result, people started asking me questions about Second Life, people from various museums. And they would come up to me at conferences like this and they would say, should our institution invest in Second Life? And they would always qualify that. We're a small museum, we don't have a lot of resources, we don't have a lot of time, we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of staff. But we worry that we're being left behind. And I would say two things to them, right? One, I would say, if you're investing in Second Life because you think what you're building is going to have any kind of longevity, then you shouldn't do it. Because obviously, that was never the purpose of that particular program. If, on the other hand, you're investing in Second Life because you want to develop that expertise, you want to learn about virtual reality, and you want to be prepared for whatever the next new thing is, then it might be something worth pursuing. But the second thing I would say to them is, are you really in a position where you as an institution feel comfortable experimenting when you're not guaranteed any kind of tangible results? Right? When what you're gonna get out of it is intangible knowledge. And that was always an interesting point to raise and the museums would have different, uh, different thoughts about that. And one of the things we'd always come back to is that there were a lot of museums experimenting in Second Life at that time. And once the museums that weren't sure whether they should experiment found out that they weren't necessarily gonna get anything tangible out of their work, but what they were gonna get was knowledge, sometimes the answer was, I'll just let somebody else get the knowledge for me, and then I will find out what the answer is. And I think about this a lot, as to who needs to be on the cutting edge when it comes to museum technology. It's not cheap, necessarily, to be on the cutting edge. And it takes a lot of work and requires a lot of expertise. And it was at Museums of the Web, right, Loic? Yep. And so at the most recent Museums of the Web, Loic and I were sitting around and we were talking about how it used to be that you could count on some of the museums with large endowments and a fair amount of resources to take on some projects for the good of the overall museum computing community. But that, as the years have gone by, that's less likely to occur. And we thought, what an interesting question to look at how the obligations, in many ways, of having a lot of resources affects the community of museum computing. So we put together this, this panel and, and, and these questions. They are necessarily provocative questions. 
And there are a lot of questions that uh, don't necessarily have good definitions of terms. And we can talk about that, that as well. So I wanted to start with this, this fairly specific question about obligations of museums that have a lot of resources. I, I hesitate to use a term like uh, noblesse oblige, though that's the term that keeps popping into my mind. What was that? Noblesse oblige. Noblesse oblige, it's French. Is it? I, yes. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> noblesse, oh no, sorry. I'm with you. It's the pronunciation. It's the pronunciation. Noblesse oblige. Noblesse oblige. Yeah. Ah, yeah. That, uh, that, you know, if, if you are lucky to come from a museum that has a lot of resources and a lot of expertise, do you have any kind of obligation to be on the cutting edge, to explore new technologies, and to share the results of your work with others? And I thought, at that point, I'd throw this question over to our panelists and say, what do you think? I might open this up. Go ahead. Well, and if we, want, if we need to start by defining terms first, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, I think it's a great question. Obviously, I, I work at the Met, um, so a museum which has you know, significant resources. We have a $300 million annual operating budget. Um, we have 2,400 members of staff. We have 6 million visitors, 33 million to the website a year. And we have a wonderful digital team, which is unfortunately smaller over the last few months, but it's 62 people. So it's a significant size team. Um, and when it comes to what our responsibility is in terms of, actually, what I, if I remove the word responsibility, just start with impact, which is actually one which really gets me. Because it's amazing how many museums, and I love doing it, come to the Met when they're starting a digital strategy and ask us for advice. So they come and so we, you know, we, we must welcome at least one museum, one museum a week who come in and we, sit, we just sit and share what we are working on, um, what we have done, what's working, what's not working. And I find the greatest, in terms of our obligation, our responsibility as a museum that, as a department that has 60 people, I think the privilege that we have in being such a large department I, is that we, we have managed to divide up roles into pre-specialist areas. So for example, we have, we have someone working on social media who can really focus on doing social media I mean, fantastically and research how to do social media fantastically. Um, we have a TMS team, so a collections management team, we have four people who are just doing collections management. If people want thoughts on how to use collections management, thoughts on conservation space, conservation studio, future directions, we have a team dedicated to looking at that, um, our email team. And they are, if you want to get into A-B testing on emails and figure out how to optimize your email program, we have a four-person email team inside the, inside the group. And so if I start thinking of our responsibilities and what we like, what the team feels proud sharing, it's that level of expertise I guess we have a privilege of acquiring and developing because we are such, a, we, our roles are very divided, are di distinct, I'm gonna say, not divided, but distinct. Within a 60 person team, we can, we can develop levels of expertise. I think our, and then you, you take that level of expertise and then that question of like, what's our obligation to share? I wonder if your obligation comes from the fact that we are a large museum or if your obligation actually comes just from the fact we're part of this community. I think no, I think everyone in this community wants to share what they've learned, no matter what it is. I don't think the obligation is necessarily tied to the, uh, to the institution itself. So I you know the, my, the team from the Met who are here, they're here because, because they love them. They, they love MCM, they love just sharing what they've learned. I don't, that's very definitely not unique to a large institution. I think that's an excellent point, and I'm really fascinated by this issue of it's not necessarily that you have more money, but that you have levels of, ex of expertise because you have so many people who can uh, dedicate themselves to, to learning things in very particular areas. And that goes the whole way down. I mean, I think the most valuable thing we have to share, actually, is like, honestly, our, our contracts. I mean, we have, we benefit from a, a council, a member, like our legal team is, is a good-sized legal team in a museum, and like, we have someone who has become specialized in writing contracts for digital projects. It's taken a while to get there, but I mean, those contracts have, uh, I found, I, I have this theory that museums are kind of not really built for digital departments. Um, you know, HR, HR departments don't really work in a way that digital needs in terms of turning people, in terms of like the skills we're looking for, or legal, um, um, 
There's a number of, um, of just the, the way that the mechanisms on a museum, the tools that are there aren't necessarily built in a way that, that responds to digital's needs. So we've had to develop responses, and I can't even imagine, at least we have a team that's scaled enough that we can work with someone in HR to really actually learn how to, what skills to look for from a digital person, from someone we want to recruit in a digital. And that person is specialized in that now. So even that part, we've, so we've built up those specialisms, um, even outside of digital, um, which I think has huge value. We're going down the row here. Uh, so, interesting, where, where you land, Loic, mm -hmm. um, I land in a similar space um, from a very different institutional location. We have a 2.5 FTE museum staff. That's not the digital staff, that's the museum staff. Um, in certain ways, that's deceptive because we're, uh, we exist as part of a university. So, for instance, we don't have facilities people among that 2.5. We don't have... Um, the sorts of general infrastructure uh, that were we a freestanding institution we would need to have, but still uh, 2.5 museum people. Um, and thinking about the framing rubric for this session in regard to being in such a small place, um, I've actually never thought of it in terms of um, larger museums being somehow obligated to be doing leading stuff that we will then expect to be able to leverage. I think that's more a second order artifact of the fact um, of just what you were getting to, Loic, that, that large museums tend to have the staff capacity and the differentiation of staff uh, specialized skill that tends to be doing work that is not meant to respond primarily to an obligation to um, smaller peer institutions, uh, but is actually meant to do what it should, which is serve the mission of that larger museum um, as a second order, often very valuable outcome of that, there can be the kinds of knowledge development, uh, testing of certain approaches to things that when shared in spaces very often, uh, like MCN meetings and museums and the web meetings, um, naturally contribute to this wider cross-community um, cross uh, conversation about these things. Um, and that there's huge value there, but not so much an obligation, more an opportunity to uh, build the field. Um, so I'm at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and um, I guess I'm in the bigger museum, but we have a $34 million um, operating budget, which is a lot, but not the Mets. And, um, and even that said, I will tell you, we feel we do not have enough resource, I mean, it's depending on what you're, you're supporting and um, expertise, you know, our salaries don't draw the developers that are doing the stuff that we've implemented at Cleveland Museum of Art. So in no way do we feel um, that, you know, well, we have this really nice group, you know, we're set to, we have to constantly negotiate and do stand, um, our contracts are, um, always about uh, figuring it out so that there is no overage or how we, or, and the maintenance is built in for the next two years because we all know like it doesn't finish the day it opens. Um, but your question of, your, you had one question about your obligation and I felt the same like, I don't feel if I went back to, that the museum has an obligation to, because we do something to support another institution. I mean personally, I feel that we're not competing against each other and whatever we can share. But if we share things, we gotta be pretty honest. And when I first started, when I opened Gallery One, I was really honest about this is good and this is good and this wasn't good and this is the way we did it and blah, blah, blah. And people were like, no, no, you can't do that. And I'm like, well, isn't that what these conferences are for? Is to say like, this was cool, this didn't work, this we thought was gonna be cool and it was better than I thought. This I totally said we can't do, the world's gonna fall apart and it's like the most popular thing ever and we're doing a version two of it. And I think by sharing that, that's why everybody who writes, everybody who wants to visit, everybody, like we, I make everyone publish everything and that anything we do is available. Because the, um, and, and there are certain things that get you know, we don't expose everything that can get the museum in trouble, but if it's about giving you help and doing something, I'm totally in favor of that. It, regarding, no one should reinvent the wheel. And like, I'm assuming that the next question will be really more about how we can work together. But I think it's more that there has to be a win-win for everybody 
to have something positive, everybody has to be getting something out of it. Um, sorry. Oh. So I, I, um, I'm at a small museum and I have worked at a big museum and I've had a, a, a relatively large team. So I've kind of experiencing it at both ends. And I think, I don't know about the word obligation. I think that there are... Um, definitely um, you don't want to reinvent the wheel but I think that so often with larger organizations the model is very different um, to, for a small museum um, you don't have the source of resources you don't have the sort of infrastructure um, you don't have the sort of budgets and so um, and the and the pace is often very different to being in a larger organization so I don't think it's it's not so much about just Tran taking one and, and, and planting it on a different uh, organization. I think, you know, I think, that, and the danger for me, I've learned, is that when we look at other organizations and we go, look at Gallery One, we should do that. And, you know, it isn't appropriate for our museum. Um, and it's not that it isn't a great project, but it's a great project for Cleveland Museum of Art. And so, in, in, and a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. And so when a director sees something like that and then says, why can't we do that? Or a trustee says, I want to put my name on that. And it's not actually right or what the organization needs, then it's a problem. So I, I'm quite, I'm sort of wary of both, you know, and it's, it's, Coming here, though, and networking and taking the good and the things that are useful, but it's not, it's, not a, 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 it, it's not everything. But I also think there's a personal obligation. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and I think, you know, people on this panel, I'm sure, will agree. I get called up a lot to ask for advice. I mentor, um, and I share whenever I can at conferences. And I think that that is of real value you know our expertise and what we bring each of us bring um to the table and um and i think that um you know we all work in institutions and whether they're small or large they basically have all the same issues we're all dealing with the same kinds of challenges and so in being able to talk about that and share about that i find enormously useful what i like about this is we go from um expertise and the importance of expertise to this notion of a, a personal obligation to share expertise and an obligation to be honest about what we've learned and what and what we've found. Um, I think later we might, I might try to turn the conversation to how that obligation to share honestly might put us at odds with perhaps the mission statement, well not the mission statement, but, but at odds with some people within our organization who may not necessarily want honest sharing, which is an interesting issue I think that Jane, I think you alluded to it at mm -hmm. some point, right? Mm -hmm. um, Thoughts from the audience on this notion of obligations with respect to museums that have a lot of resources. Can, can I ask a question sure. of our audience? Yes, please do. So, can I ask Megan a question from, from because <laughs> yeah. I, no, no, because I think you have a really interesting project where you are in a big, you're sitting in a big museum, but you're serving communities of you know museum a museum community often that is one man and his dog literally in a in a in a one horse one one dog town so i just i just i'm interested to know like what's your the, your your thoughts on that What Carolyn's referring to is the program that I manage at the Canadian Museum of History, and it's called the Virtual Museum of Canada. It's an investment program, so we have $2.2 million available annually to Canadian museums for digital projects. So there are 2,400 museums in Canada, and 86% um, of them have fewer than 10 staff. So, you know, there's 14% that would fall in the medium to large, or medium large and large categories, so the, the vast majority are small. Um, as an investment program, that is an obligation to serve that community. So we feel very strongly that we have to reflect the needs of that huge range of, of museums in the country and not just serve um, you know, a certain tranche or, or level of museum, but everybody from the volunteer-run um, historic house that's open for three months in the summer and puts in their newsletter that they got 300 visitors that summer and they made $1,000 selling apple pies, <laughs> right up to you know big museums like the Art Gallery of Ontario or the Royal, the Royal Ontario Museum. So 
Um, but we sit in a national museum, so our investment program is run by the Canadian Museum of History, and we draw on the resources of that institution to support the work of our team. So we're kind of a little body in a big body serving all the bodies across Canada, which is, I guess does give me kind of a unique perspective. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or sheds any light. I guess I was just, because it's, it, it, in a way, you're dealing with this problem every day. Yeah. You, and, and you're trying to develop a program that actually really looks very specifically at this question. Well, and we yeah. have the tiny investment program for the littles who are struggling and, and, you know, digital is one thing that they know they need to do, but they're having, um, you know, challenges just doing their basic um, museological things day to day. And then we've got the bigs who are better resourced, but it's all relative. Like you may have large operating budgets, but you've got a lot of staff and you've got a big building and a massive collection. So it's a sliding scale. I don't think just because you're bigger and your ops budget is bigger, you have more of an obligation or a greater capacity even. Um, so yeah, in terms of what we do, we, I talk to museums all the time. I've been on a road trip across Canada um, meeting many of them, and we have to bear in mind at all times what the needs of those sort of three sizes are. Um, and they're wildly disparate in terms of their needs. And just as a small anecdote, the word innovation is striking real fear into the heart of the majority of the littles. Um, the mediums and the bigs are a little more comfortable, so we may have to reframe that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that, that question of fear, uh, Strikes, strikes a chord for me, and, and perhaps a segue to a, to a conversation about the changing nature of the computing environment and how that affects this particular question. Uh, I, I teach a lot of LIS students uh, at Florida State, and uh, there will be a certain number of the students who are slightly afraid of taking on um, knowledge and learning about new computing technologies. And one of the things that I always tell them is that time is working for them. That as every year goes by, the hurdle they have to get over gets smaller, and their reward for getting over that hurdle gets bigger. You think back 20 years ago to what you would have had to do to put together a website and have some information about yourself online, and compare that to what you need to do today to have a personal website where you can promote yourself and apply for jobs and everything. Mm. And you can see how that change has been so dramatic. And sometimes that helps students who are afraid about learning a new technology realize that with a little bit of an investment, they can get a tremendous reward. And I'm wondering how that change reflects in the, in the question that we're dealing with today. Do these, how can the smaller museums leverage these new opportunities with computing technologies to take leadership roles that maybe previously they wouldn't have been able to because they didn't have the financial resources? Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give it, I mean, it's, it, it interests me because I look at smaller museums and I mean, as, at the Met we're having, we're, we're having fun um, getting people to accept the MVP concept. Um, it's deemed as not appropriate to, to a museum of our quality and stature. Um, and so we, we've, we've had to go to, we, we now call it the minimum, lov minimum lovable product, because um, that shows that we're caring. Um, I think when people thought it was minimum viable product, it shows a lack of care for the work. It, the, the word implies a lack of care for what we're doing. Um, and I have to admit, I look towards smaller institutions who have, who have been able to, to launch quicker, um, to be more agile, to launch things that are a little bit scrappy and need fixing when, or just because it was the MVP and they just got going. And that's something that I, my team certainly wishes we, we were able to do more of. Um, it's definitely a behavior trait that we, um, that we envy per se in, um, in smaller institutions. Um, whereas, you know, when the Met is all about everything being absolutely perfect um, from day one when the New York Times review will come out. Um, and that's our, that's our way. Um, so I think there is something there that a, that a small institution can do, which can do more of the MVP type product project, which is just, I mean, it actually just, it's just better practice in the scheme of things. Yeah, I had, had not put that together with this, top, with this session topic yet, but yeah, totally agree. I think we have, as a very small place that is, um, among other things, not on the radar of New York Times reviewers. <laughs> further off that radar than sometimes we would wish, but you know, <laughs> upside, downside. Um, we, we do have room to do things like launch a revamped collection search site when we know that 
it's that there are certain issues with it. Yeah. Um, public beta, even when it first launched, it was effectively a public alpha. Um, I even put that up at the top just so people wouldn't fuss too badly public as alpha. they public alpha. Nice. Um, and it was that way for a month or two until I fixed the rest of the stuff. But we knew that there would be ultimately for our users um, value in the 85% of it that was working perfectly fine for discovery, uh, while there were a few things that were still known broken. Uh, but we could flip the switch, because we knew that we would not get a scathing review on the first page of Arts and Leisure the next Sunday. Uh, and so that's, that's definitely true. I'm not sure how much that actually folds back into value to share back to the field. It's more something that is an enabling factor for us in certain ways. Uh, but but yeah, it is certainly different for scale there. Um, I don't remember the exact question because I know it sort of has, but um, one of the, it's sort of, uh, I'm a big believer that we are all, we, none of us have enough resources to do the stuff we're expected to do. And we're spinning our wheels a lot of things. And we come to these conferences and we share and we talk about a lot about the outward products, but a lot of it has to be on um, standardization of, of what we're doing in the back end so that when we do spend a lot of money on developing something new that everyone can just, you know, everyone has an API that can plug into their back system. And maybe if you're small enough and you don't even have a back system, like that you're part of where do I start, that everything has to be scalable, that it can grow with what you're doing. So I always think that the, my idea is that we should be in these co-ops. I mean, there's things that smaller, medium, and, and big museums, there could be the right fit, and the smaller museums are the perfect place for the prototypes. That's, and it's even like the first, you know, where you could really try that out and, you know, have, and it'd be acceptable. To, to get it going and just, you know, and there you have your, your prototype that you get. And then you can get that, you're a big enough museum, you can get that heard about, you can get sponsorship, you can show that it works, you can see where you need to tweak it. And that's where I'm going more is in this sort of co-op groups and, um, and also foundations are really looking at that. I know like the Knight Foundation came a couple years ago and they were like, we want to give Gallery One to smaller museums. And I was like, that's even you know we you can have it but you can't do that cuz you know they don't have a digitized collection and it's all customized and do they they don't need a wall in that in a place that only two people work you know like this is they you know so i i do think that there's opportunities to really take advantage of it but again it's about sort of what are your main goals and what it has to be a win win for everybody and then i do think we can sort of make some leverage Okay. Well, I mean, it's, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting question because it seems like the the concerns about the available resources going down are offset in part by the fact that what it takes to innovate, what it costs to innovate, may also be going down as well. So this leads to these new opportunities, and I wonder then if the problem is not who innovates, but who is able to share. So do you have a culture at your institution that promotes sharing? of results and finding and encourages encourages the idea that the work you are doing is for the betterment of the museum computing com, museum computing community as opposed to for the betterment of the institution is there a line drawn how do you define it how do you cross it uh, oh, my sorry. my museum does not care about the museum computing community right now um, Did everyone I, hear that yeah. okay, okay. Um, i think our boss is here <laughs> she doesn't want I don't know if this is being recorded. <laughs> I'm saying that in the nicest possible way. And the reason I'm saying that is because we don't, we're at the start of a journey. You know, we, 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 uh, we, are, um, we are in a startup situation. And um, 
we don't have the luxury of, 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 of kind of having anything to share about right now um, other than, you know, where we are today. And um, I think that where we would like to be, our aspiration is that, you know, for the size of museum that we are, for the budget and for the resources, that we can become an exemplar for other museums that are like us. And, that, and then we'll be happy to share and talk about it. And we would want to do it. And I, I actively, you know, will, will encourage that. But right now... We're, we're very focused on just getting ourselves um, going and putting an infrastructure in place and actually not really uh, focusing on sexy projects um, that, that um, it's actually, you know, hardcore infrastructure, um, you know, get it, getting the foundations in place. So I would say, we're, you know, it, it's very dependent on where you are in, in the process. And I'm just, um, I would say that I totally agree with that except that whatever foundations you're putting in place that you're you're working to that there is we start to standardize that that you start to say that small even if you only have this much be that because the thing is you still want to be able to share these experiences whatever they are be it ticketing or outward or anything at some point and if you've spelt all this information on this infrastructure that's not compatible um, but to answer your question I was going to jump in and say that um, our museum doesn't care if technology is sharing because they don't know. They, you know, they, they, you know, they're like, <laughs> what they care about is money. They care about this that this is taking away, um, out of our operating budget. So what they want to know, th their thing is with Gallery One was like, did we patent it? Did we patent? It? We're like, we're not patenting it. No one's going to buy it. Like, no one's even going to use it. And if someone does, we're not going to sue them because it would cost more than it, you know, like, like that was their thing. Or how much are we charging the app? I heard MoMA charge five dollars. It was like, no, we're not charging. We just want people to download it. And so. That's when I realized, okay, it's about money. So if we can show them that working together or figuring out different models that save them money or gives us more money to do more things, then they're listening. So I don't think they care about sharing it unless it, I mean, in fact, you can make it a positive for them to like it. It sounds exactly like the Office of Commercialization at my university. All right, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I would, uh riff on very much the same direction Carolyn and Jane have just taken this, which is to say, uh, certainly in our case, if, if I were ever to propose that even just I myself spend a big chunk of my time working on something on the clock that was for the greater good of the museum community but would not serve our mission directly at home, non-starter, and I wouldn't even feel right doing that because uh -huh. more than anyone there probably, I feel acutely like here's all this stuff that somehow or other engages with digital platforms or tools that I want to do because I know we can leverage the value of our collection in regard to mission in all these ways. And what I, so what I'm really carving out time to do has to be that stuff. But in a very close follow-on second order kind of way, um, as that stuff is happening to serve mission, um, there is often very immediate ancillary value from it that by communicating openly with the community about here are some things we're doing in a very small shop, um, here's how we're doing it in ways that work, here's how we're doing it in ways that sure didn't work on the first iteration, but it was better on the second and maybe better on the third. Um, that's, that's where it loops back to um, value to the community, but it's not a selling point up front. It's a kind of value that can be realized pretty quickly downstream. Um, the other thing I would say too is that um, thinking about the general notion of transferability of what works and what doesn't, which is implicit through a lot of this, um, I think the general assessment of what works and what doesn't, take exhibit A, some technology project in some space, like Jane was saying in their instance, um, what works in one place may well be a terrible fit for another place. There may well be pieces of its value and its approach that do translate well, uh, but there can be an initial danger of thinking that there's some sort of objective testability of something that's a successful thing and a successful approach, but that is highly context dependent. Um, and I think the real value is in hashing it out in conversations like this, which more often happen in hotel hallways and bars, uh, but they're equally valuable either place, where um, it's about teasing out, okay, sure, this worked for you, why did it work? How did it connect to your mission? What kinds of resources did it need? 
uh, were those resources in your context sustainable? And if I tried to do something like it under my roof, uh, would it be sustainable or would it be so intensive that after launching this super cool thing, 18 months later, not only is it not maintainable, but all that other stuff we didn't do for a year and a half is now killing us. Um, so I think there's institutional context can radically bear on the, the value and the practicality and the dangers uh, of adopting something from somewhere else, which is why it's so great to talk about all this. Um, it's interesting, I feel like when you say that, it builds off that idea of what Carolyn was saying earlier, the, the danger of a little bit of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I feel genuinely, I mean, I've heard from colleagues who have told me you know, we, we've had to, I mean, we, we, we basically closed down the media lab of the museum due to, due to, to, to costs, so just to having to lower our expenses. I've heard from other museums that have labs that had to write email to their, that, you know, feedback came back in their museum, oh, the Met has closed down their lab we still have a lab, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And I genuinely, I'm like, that's part of the impact, I guess, of the Met. I feel genuinely sorry for those institutions that that question arose at all. Um, I think it clearly raises some, I mean, it shows that at the top there was a little bit of knowledge side and they felt comfort. If a Met has a lab, maybe we should have a lab. Um, but obviously the fact that we did was responding implicitly to, to, to our mission and what we were trying to achieve in that moment in time. Um, it's kind of scary, I mean, we have to acknowledge if, if that's how if decisions are being made because a large institution is doing it's kind of it's not a great sign for our institution itself to be honest um, we should be asking larger questions of of what the expectations are of leadership when we actually ask you that question decided to close down a bunch of their platforms yep. where they were sharing if I'm working at a very small museum and it was a uh, uh, all that fear and anxiety that one feels about keeping up was like, it was an extremely liberating moment because, <laughs> unlike, because it was like, oh, well, if they can change their exactly. path yeah. and do something else, well, then all of a sudden there isn't some set best practice yep. that everyone needs to follow in line with, that it's about doing what is best for your institution in that particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with that more, and I, especially as an institution now, like we... I mean, um, Carolyn again mentioned that this idea of like being in startup mode. Um, and I feel like right now I'm an institution who is just basically coming out of startup mode. Um, we're, having that, we're having that moment where you get poked, and you come out of startup and you get, get into operational mode. And that's now, I mean, we don't have the benefit of you know, being acquired by another company <laughs> and like not having to get to operational mode. And that's our world now. So I guess when I think of our responsibility, if we could help institutions uh, get more efficiently into operational mode because that is where we have to get to. We can't we can't exist perennially in the startup mode. We have to get to operational. And we have to get all our functions functions live and running. I guess if, you, if we can help institutions do that more efficiently through again just openly sharing knowledge, it's great. I'm I'm glad that gives people relief. You know, if, the, if a big institution can't do it, what does it show? I and mean, I hope the next thing we do is just like email each other and like pick up a phone and say, hey, just give me, a little, give me the inside knowledge on that. And in most, I think people take that call in this community and that's really important. But it can also cause, like, I'm just remembering um, uh, last year, the Culture Girl article that said nothing in Gallery One worked and nothing at the Cobra, it was like this, like, and um, I got all these emails from small <laughs> museums that said, because I've been helping them like think of ways to get going, and this article was totally inaccurate, but you know, there's nothing you can do about it. But they said that people who didn't want money to go to digital were putting the article on their desk and said, see, it doesn't even work. You know? And that was <laughs> like, yeah, it was a little bit of knowledge, and it was moving, but it was not in a relief. It was like these people who were finally getting the money to start the digitization of their product. It was like, well, why? Like, it's, it, you know, in the end, Technology doesn't work, you know, and so um, it is your 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 responsibility can like frustrate or give people relief depending on what's going on. So. And what's fascinating about this is that this is a shift in perhaps an understanding of what the responsibility of being a leader in museum computing is. That it's really no longer do you have the resources to innovate, but what are going to be the repercussions of the innovations that you do. Right? What is it going to mean when a museum shuts down their, their innovative technologies? Is that a relief for other people? If something goes wrong, what's the cascading effect on that, on others? And I suspect that when we start these projects, we aren't thinking about those possible ripple effects, and I wonder if we need to. I don't know. 
Well, I think what we, uh, I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm jumping in, but one thing I do think we keep forgetting, you didn't even plan for this, so I'm worried. No. <laughs> um, no, one of the, right now there's a session, like, after the launch, which drives me crazy that it's at the same time as this, because there's a lot of, like, crossovers. But one thing I think that we don't really think about is we, we've touched on, like, after the launch, getting into operation, moving from, you know, project management to product management, and um, how we don't really think about that, but if we were working as a as a co-op, like when all of a sudden everything moves to a new operating system, or you know all this stuff we didn't plan for, because now we have moved on to other projects, and this 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 one project that was actually easy, an easy win, it was easy to develop. With all, well, all of a sudden it's causing us headaches because people are using it, and we had it as a quick a quick project that didn't cost that much money, it is now costing us resources all the time. So I don't know if, again, we have an obligation because of everybody else, but if we were if we were more of a team in different areas, we would all be thinking of, okay, let's this is gonna happen. We would have each other to rely on instead of just one person who has to now figure out how they're gonna maintain this when they have 10 other projects going. I wonder if then the flip side of this culture of sharing is this expectation on the part of a lot of museum directors, shall we say, that your institution needs to keep up with your peer or aspirational mm. institutions. <laughs> so uh, to that end, you, I mean, we've kind of skirted around this, but my question is what kinds of collaboration happens outside of conferences between leadership? and? You know, are you on conference calls together, Slack channels? You know, what? It seems to me like collaboration a lot of times starts at you know at the bottom and then works its way up. Then we have to petition for funding and projects. It would be a lot easier if we could meet in the middle. I, I mean, I, I um, there's a lot more collaboration in the UK. Um, I, you know, we're a smaller country. We're geographically smaller, and it was a lot easier for. Um, heads of digital to get together um, and have you know face-to-face -face meetings and in fact we uh, for the National Museums we set something up so that there was a regular meeting which we would have in different people's uh, institutions and we would share um, I mean I myself did a project with nine national museums which was a, collabor a collaborative project and you know we had at one end Tate and the British Museum and at the other end the Sir John Soane's Museum you know and you are only as strong as your weakest partner and and so you know that was a really interesting project and a difficult project and but at the end of the day every single one of those national museums has their own systems you know it's not really different to here because we're not technology companies, you know, and, and I think, you know, a lot of what has happened has, has come out from organic growth. You know, we've, we need a website, we need a collections management system, we need a dams, we need this. And, and it's only, I think, really in the last few years where this idea of, of, of building an ecosystem, this idea of having a more holistic, integrated approach, the understanding that actually we're not set up as institutions to support that way of working, all of these things now I think are more, you know, we're talking about them more, but it's still, you know, a difficult challenge for us in our own organizations. And, um, and I think that's, you know, that really, we're still battling that um, and we'll continue to do so. And, I um, and so I, I you know I think the co-op idea is great, but but and the and certainly the knowledge sharing and the networking is invaluable, but um, I still think it's a really hard model, um, you know, but really be based on where we all are. The only reason I bring that at that it's thought, a good one, but I it's hard. Done it, but Tessa Tura is doing it. I mean, they're really no. But, yes, they are. Uh, I mean, yes, I'm. It's different, but they started sort of, and they have a pricing model based on the size, and they've been growing it, and they're, you know, I, I mean, I personally don't lead them, but. I think, I, I mean, I think of, I think that model's amazing. I think they, and there's, there's only a certain number of core systems that can follow that kind of model. I mean, I, so I won't name the other kind of systems I wish could be, we could do that around, but you know, it, it's the big ones. Um, but to that point about, you know, you talk about collaboration and how, I mean, certainly what I did about two years ago was just, I mean, I picked three people in, three kind of colleagues in other museums, and every six weeks I'm on a call with one of them. So, I mean, every two weeks I'm talking to someone. So, I mean, I encourage you while you're here, 
find two colleagues and just make the commitment. You are going to talk every six weeks for one hour about whatever you are working on. You will swap contracts, you will swap RFPs, you'll swap staffing problems. You know, you, and because ultimately, like, in all of, from anyone you're learning from, you want to know the context in which they are working. And to learn the context in which they are working, you need to spend time on it. Um, so I think of the people I'm talking to now, I, I've under, I understand the, the shifts in their institutions when they're making particular decisions, I'm understanding that decision. We are giving each other advice on that. Um, but I guess from a collaboration, like start small, like pick, on it while you're here, give yourself a goal, two people to meet and tell each other, we'll call each other every six weeks because they're in a similar context to you and build a collaboration up that way. Certainly that's what I did. Um, I find it incredibly valuable. I feel like I have three kind of like career coaches um, who are helping me navigate my way through it, through challenges, opportunities, the good and the bad. I mean, actually, just, um, you know, just thinking about that, I mean, M MCN, we do have these special interest groups. Yep. Um, I was just thinking the same thing. You know, I mean, there yep. is a ready-made community there of people who, um, you know, are, you know, like-minded and, and could give you loads of advice, and it's free. And, you know, so I, I really encourage you to uh, reach out and yep. sign up for, 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 for some of those groups if, if they're relevant for you. Um, and I also, you know, I, I go back to the point I made at the beginning, the, the, the kind of mentoring, you know, looking, looking for people out there that you think are doing good work um, and seeing whether or not they would be interested in, you know, in having a monthly phone call with you, a Skype call with you, a chat through just to, so that you are, you are getting some support, you don't feel isolated and, yeah. you know, you're, 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 you know, and, and it's a rewarding experience for, 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 for both parties. I'm just going to give a call out to the IT SIG, which um, I have a sort of CTO, and I haven't left it because there's always a good question once in a while, and even though someone's always on it, I mean, it goes from, what are you guys doing with your device rentals to, we're changing our ticketing system, and we, we need, how did you, you know, migrate your data to, how do we get the, has anyone used this product? And I have to say, it's a very active group, and once, I think it's a month, it might be more, but once a month they have a call that people dial into. And I will say it is so part of, the, like, in the background, but I can't let go of it because information comes in all the time. And just the other day I was like, oh, I need that. Like, that's something I want to give to things. So that, I, I actually do find that's a group that is really, you know, valuable. And since, since we're touching on, on some MCN resources here, I would also just say that, if you, regardless of whether you do or don't set up a periodic call with people you've met face to face here, which is a wonderful model, I love that. Um, and alongside the SIGs, there is also, there are those moments when suddenly you are faced with sourcing a particular kind of service or, or thinking about a particular uh, tool that's going to address some certain need. Um, there are almost always other people uh, in the MCN community who have recently or are currently assessing similar kinds of things and the kind of ad hoc timely shout out to MCNL just saying, hey folks, we're looking at this. Um, in many cases I know of has led to some really productive back channel, of course, off, typically off list uh, fairly soon. Um, chances to harvest uh, really timely knowledge from other people who you may never have met but are also on the list and um, have been dealing with some of the same things. So that's a on-the-fly discovery channel, I guess we could call it. So, so it seems like what, what we're saying here on the panel is that as the decades have gone by, <clears throat> the ability for every institution, regardless of size and resources, to get involved with innovative technology has, has gotten better and better. Um, and that in many ways, the problems we're facing aren't with innovation, but with the culture of sharing and whether or not the work that we're doing inside of our museum is transferable outside and how that looks to all the parties involved vis-a-vis -vis our internal responsibilities to our shareholders and everybody else that has a stake in the institution and the broader community of museum computing of which we are all members. And I'm wondering if any of the panelists have any thoughts about how do you balance those two sides of that coin? Right, so it's no longer large versus small. This is a problem that everybody has. Right, how do you keep your, your stockholders happy while at the same time contributing to the community that, that you may be the only one in your institution that you belong to? Um, 
I see it as professional development for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of giving back um, to the community and um, you know doing things like this, which are you know part of my part of my professional work. Um, and I don't expect my community to. Um, they, I mean, they've supported me by by paying for me to come. Um, but you know, this is I think for me is 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 you know where where I see the value. Um, personally. Yeah, no, I would just add that along with that, if one, once in a while in making the case to uh, people who may or may not make professional development a priority, there's also the fairly tight loops of added value uh, that come back to the home institution by having people who are engaged in um, events like this, where it's not only about pushing out knowledge of what you've been working on and what's working and not working in your particular context, uh, but it's also about being enmeshed in a community of other people who are doing it. So then when your own institution has needs, uh, there are places to harvest some information. So it does loop back pretty quickly in ways that on the one hand can't be pinned down predictably as to what they'll be, uh, but the general fact that it's likely to happen um, and add value back at home is pretty much always true. So, well, first of all, let me, let me ask here if there's questions from the audiences before I move into sort of a takeaway. Question here in the back. Hi, guys. Um, one thing that I just noticed just listening to the panel, which is funny, is that one thing that, is, that strikes me just having worked with so many different scales of institutions is that, you know, at the end of the day, the goals are somewhat different and they're consistently different dependent on the size. So like just after another panel, someone came up to a large institution and asked a question like, well, how do I do that at my institution? And the question that my colleague said from a large institution was, well, what are your goals at the small institution? And in the end, they were actually like completely different because like, you know, at the Met, you have to deal with volume. And that volume equation is just such a different equation than if you're literally not able to capture the audience. So I thought maybe that's something you guys can speak to about when you're working with colleagues on these different levels, how that translates. I mean, I, I completely agree, because it kind of scares me when people come and say that a Met is doing something and you know, ask how they can do it. Because I think of the pieces that I would be really proud of people learn from Emet is I, I do think that the models that we have learned in terms of what we do internally, we, what we, what we uh, do internally, what we outsource, there's some interesting learnings there um, around how we do a project. It's, like, it's more of a how we do a project, what's our philosophy, our approach, which I would be, which I would be proud, recommend some people to, to learn from, not necessarily take the whole thing, but I do think there's, there's things we have learned there in our philosophy where I think has has value beyond where we are right now, even to the way, yeah, the way we start any, the way we start any project. I always think that any project, like the first 20% of a project is where all the, all the, the, the good stuff or the bad stuff kind of happens. If you, if you fail the first 20% of your project or you go wrong in that initial period, you're kind of done for because you're kind of pointed already in a wrong direction, getting your goals right. So how to manage those conversations, I think there's a lot of expertise to be shared. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting because even Frankly, I, mean, I, I don't really even consider, I, mean, I, I consider like Cleveland to be a big museum. Um, I just consider the Met to be disproportionate. In the, I, mean, I, I mean, genuinely, I mean, you say your budget's 30 million, um, and like, so you're temp, you know, it makes you 10% of the size of a Met, and the Cle it's, a, it's phenomenal, like, that's a so Cleveland museum. Like, how can that not be a big museum? So I kind of, that, I almost, you know, sometimes wonder, I think, if it, it I mean, let's not quote me, you know, would it, would it actually be easier if a Met wasn't there for people to point to? And, say, and like have trustees point to it and say, hey, the Met just did this, because our scale, I mean, there really is, there's, there's not even something like half our scale. You know, we, are, we look at MoMA and kind of get jealous, uh, but they have like half a visitation of us, um, you know, but just much smaller. It's a really, I mean, we are just off the scale in that sense. It's almost, it'd almost be safer if we weren't there to, safer for people not to point at us. Um, I always look at, when we say size and budget, I look at the collection size being in, um, digital and technology. If you have, well, but I also love our size. It's yeah, 50,000. And 50,000, 50,000, and it's a highly vetted, it's a really good collection, so obviously if it wasn't it, but a 50,000 
like that's doable to do some stuff. When you have like 600,000, a million, all that. Yeah, it's like the idea of getting every, and I know when everything's not fully digitized, you always have those, like what do you do when that happens? What do you do when that happens? And now we want to get details and how do you do with that happens? And, and so, so smaller sometimes is better and I always think I, I like the size for what we got to experiment with because it was big enough and but small enough still. But smaller sometimes is really better. You really get to back to like, you know, just get going and try. So if, if I were to, to summarize a few takeaway points here, and I wanted to try to leave us with a couple of action items or at least one. Um, it, it, it seems like, well, while size maybe does matter in many ways in terms of what people are able to do, perhaps the, uh, the issue that we tried to start this conversation with of large versus small is, is much of a red herring. That, that it's not necessarily that you have a lot of money or you don't have a lot of money. But more of that, as technology has changed, people will come more to the realization that technology is easy, but culture is hard. And as an action item or a takeaway question perhaps for the, the panelists to, to end on, how can MCN as a community encourage a culture of innovation? I'll fill the silence for a second here and just say it's a little bit obvious to state, but we may as well make it explicit. I think that um, maintaining MCN's role as a both a community and in this sense a conference where it really is a welcoming place to share negative results mm. uh, is crucial. Uh, and the, I've, in many conferences here, I can't actually summon to mind a single instance in which somebody was up at the front of a room sharing a story of something that ended up failing miserably in whole or in part uh, and encountered any sort of, you know, jeering or <laughs> any, um, I you know, believe that's in the disrespectful MCN engagement. conference guidelines, right? Yeah, pretty, I think, well, now it's been formalized, yes, right. but even before it was. Um, and, and there's, it's easy to lose track of that because we kind of take it for granted here, but it's incredibly valuable. I mean, there are certainly other professional gatherings where um, just this very open discussion of, we did this and here's what worked and here's what really was terrible. Um, would there'd be serious disincentives to doing that. And the fact that this is a space where that's useful, that's in fact that the stories of the pieces of things that didn't work are often the ones that save everybody in the room, or at least some people in the room, uh, the most pain a month later or a year later, because they can just remember, wait a minute, Loic told me that this was a really bad idea, so we don't need to go there. Um, because the way in which it was a bad idea would be likely to make it a bad no, idea well, also say, in our context. The Mets said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. I mean, keep, keeping in mind that, that some things work or fail in different institutional contexts, but, but still that general openness to uh, discussing failure is incredibly valuable. Yeah, absolutely, because in many ways, money is less of a stumbling block than a fear of failure. And having a safe space to talk about failure uh, as part of a community is key, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and in the areas in which I would dare say probably all of us work, um, if you're not failing sometimes, it's an old saw, but you're probably not trying enough. If you're not failing, you're not on the cutting edge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to add to that. <laughs> well, I was going to, you said, you know, how can we encourage innovation? And it's so funny how certain words like lose their all of a sudden no one wants to hear the word innovation and then everyone we have a new word no one wants to hear digital strategy no one wants to hear that like you know we get we burn out on these things and so I would say that the reason I come to this and encourage people to be part of this and I'm um, and anyone who says you know what should I, where should I start um, is because. I, we want to, I mean, our, our goal is the visitor experience, getting our collection out there. You know, th these are the goals, and everyone here has to support them in a different way that is sort of foreign maybe to the museum or is new to the museum. And so, you, I, I mean, I'm glad we have a safe space to talk about failures and really tell the truth, 
But I also like to really hear, like, you know, we were able to actually increase our audience just by having the door swing outward. Like, mm -hmm. there was no technology involved, but we then had the digital sign right when you, like, and, and that is huge. And that has me go back and start rethinking again and re, it sort of re, char it charges you again. And the other thing, um, being, you know, when you come to these conferences, the question about, you know, what should I start and do? I'm saying, also when you meet someone and you have the same issues, like, you know, being being on a panel together, you get to know each other better. And you do, even if they aren't your mentor, you call every month, they are someone like, I got to know Douglas. And I I mean, I constantly like, can I have a copy of your your this? Can I have your job description for this? Can I have, I mean, I, crawl, I write out to the same people. Loic, what are you doing? Who are you hiring for the second thing? He never tells me all the time. You, you but never, you, <laughs> Jane, you, you never email me. <laughs> Apparently a culture of sharing only goes so far. But, but the, I mean, you know, it's a small meeting. No, okay. <laughs> Carolyn is too busy at doing everything. Carolyn is a huge resource. And actually, three years ago when I met Carolyn, I was like, I need to pick this girl's brain. No, seriously. I know, but I know, no, 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 stop now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think what we've seen here is that is that we can all reach out to a to a culture of leadership. That a lot of the the hurdles maybe that might have stopped people from being leaders in the technology museum computing space 20 years ago are much much smaller today. And I, and I hope that within all of our institutions we reach a point where we can push those kind of leadership roles. So that, that's my hope for you, and I hope we'll take take, take away an action item. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their thoughts and their contributions, and thank you all for coming to this session, and uh, enjoy the, uh, the opening reception. Mm -hmm.